Hello, everybody. My name is Robert Riley, an interventional cardiologist at the Christ Hospital in Cincinnati. And on behalf of the TCTMB CHIP newsletter, I'd like to welcome you again to our latest installment in the CHIP update series. Now, this is a series that we've talked about, you know, that we've started to really interview luminaries in the interventional cardiology field, special focus on various issues pertinent to the CHIP space. And today, uh, I have someone who really needs no introduction, Dr. Jeff Moses, uh, an interventional cardiologist and professor of medicine at Columbia, New York truly one of the founding fathers of the CHIP movement. It's truly a pleasure to have him with us today. So welcome, Dr. Moses. My pleasure, good to see you. Absolutely. Um, so as most of our viewers know, uh, Dr. Moses has an extensive experience performing complex procedures, has been a leader in both CHIP in terms of clinical in investigation and education, and has been at the forefront of defining complex PCI his extensive experience in the CHIP arena from its inception uh, to current day is really the focus of our interview today. So we'll, we'll kind of just start uh, talking about, telling us a little bit about your current practice and how your career has evolved over the years. Yeah, well, I mean, my, well, the dimensions of my current practice is, is my fellows will tell you, the, the large part of it are people who have either been told they have no options or actually referred by other interventional cardiologists. Um, I remember one clinic when I had one of my, uh, my fellows, uh, I had actually a very straightforward case come to me, you know, someone with a symptoms, a positive stress test, mm -hmm. and he comes in and we, you know, we're reviewing the case. He goes, why is this patient seeing you? <laughs> well, you know, I can do simple cases too. <laughs> I don't mind them. <laughs> so it shows you the complexion. But, um, but, uh, so, but what's interesting in terms of the evolution, I'm just thinking about this for this interview, is when, when I started doing angioplasty, I really helped start the program at Cornell. Now, people don't, a lot of people don't know the earlier history of, uh, of PCI, but the first angioplasty in America was done in New York City by Simon Sturzer at Lenox Hill. Now, if you know the geography of New York City is uh, Cornell's on 68th Street and York Avenue, and about 10 blocks away is Lenox Hill. <laughs> now, Simon Sturgeon was one of the pioneers, an incredible talent. So virtually, I was struggling to start a program there because anyone, any, quote, elective case that they had, if they were considered anatomically eligible, they preferred to go to Sturzer because back then he'd already done hundreds of them. In those days, it was like an enormous number. So my referral base was actually from our surgeons internally who were sending me cases they didn't want to operate on. So as you can imagine what that was back then. So I actually cut my teeth in a, a lot of very tricky and high risk cases. I'm not saying we solved all the problems in retrospect, you know, this was balloon angioplasty, which was an incredibly limited technology. But the point is I was at the very outset of building a program at Cornell, I was confronted with really trying to solve problems that really there was no precedent for. Because what did you do with the surgical turndown? Well, before angioplasty, they died um, or lived with disability. So it's really sort of, I sort of got thrown into it. And, and the good news is the surgeons were very supportive because I would say, well, you know, this is high risk. And they would say, well, it's less risky than what I would do to them. So uh, that really started my thinking along these uh, lines. Um, what compounded it and sort of, I guess, shaped my practice was the fact that New York State was the first state to actually publish individual outcomes for first with surgery and then with angioplasty. And this led to the, what, you know, what we know now is you know, the risk avoidance and the, you know, the, and the, the, the risk benefit paradox. And it really, I won't say it started in New York, but it certainly first got quantified in New York. And a lot, and you know, the adage I had then was, well, what does high risk mean? Does it mean high risk to the operator or is it high risk to the patient? And a lot of the operators were calculating their risks, you know, their risks, their personal risks and, you know, for the publications of their data. And I still decided that I would still calculate the risk, you know, the, what are the odds for the patient? And this, you know, extended obviously early with data, which still is prevalent for cardiogenic shock, where it became evident that there was risk avoidance in New York in the shock population. As you know, and there's wide publications that have, you know, analyzed that, looking at angioplasty 
outcomes versus disease outcomes. Uh, when you saw low, low mortality with MIs, but higher MI mortality, yeah. low PCIs, but low, higher mortality with MI overall in New York State. And this was also shown that the Cleveland Clinic was showing their referrals from New York, surgical referrals, were also at higher mortality. So it, that really started it. And I, I think um, I just felt it was my job to do two things. One, advocate for the patient, but B, leave a lot of headroom in your program so you could absorb the occasional bad outcome with the high risk patient, but still take them in. And that actually required, I won't say, I'm gonna say an attempt for perfection in the low risk. You could not mess up on low risk cases. So you needed the headroom. And I was never gonna have the lowest mortality. I was not gonna have a zero mortality in my program, but I was still able to keep it well within bounds. And frankly, very frequently with the quote, a double asterisk. In other words, we could actually have statistically lower mortality than the, uh, uh, than, you know, than the, the statewide average. Not that mortality was actually, as we know now, a very good indicator of quality. But that's sort of the thread that got, you know, got me uh, deep into this in terms of, uh, you know, risk avoidance and also really a passion for making this technology uh, solve problems for patients. Absolutely. I mean, I, it's so interesting to hear you say that you started this journey with surgical turndowns and here we are still talking about how do we take care of surgical turndowns. I mean, it's really, it's, and, and I think that that flows into this idea that I think sometimes for younger, younger folks who don't have the same years who, who, who try to practice in this realm, one of the big critiques is often that, you know, it, it, it's just these guys, I think the term is gorillas trying to beat their chest and showing what they can do. And I think one of the frustrating things is, is that it really stems a lot from what you said, which is, look, we have patients who have been given no options this started by people trying to say, well, let's think of some creative ways that we can take care of these patients. Again, talking about risks and benefits, and that's still what we're doing today. And I think that that speaks to the attitude behind the people that started this movement. It speaks to the attitude of the people that have continued this movement. And I, I really hope and pray it'll be the attitude of the people that continue this movement moving forward in the future. Um, so transitioning, so, so <laughs> this is, I. This is great. I uh, thought about this and I really wanted to ask this question just up front. Sure. We, we go to these meetings, we go to these CHIP meetings, they use this term CHIP. I, I, I had a CHIP fellowship, an actual CHIP fellowship, but we still, we still don't know what CHIP means. So, so, so Jeff, I gotta ask you point blank during this interview, can you define CHIP for us once and for all? <laughs> <laughs> right here, right now, this is the definitive, the definitive definition yeah well i think it's it's a question of you know what is you know what is the presumed outcome in other words and it could be if it's a if it's a, a difficult outcome a complex case could be several things obviously comorbidities are a huge part of it and and that's a whole different skill set of management whether it's renal failure hemodynamics, et cetera. And then there's the anatomic aspects of it in terms of, uh, and, you know, and, and just to sort of give you the background of this, for a long time, a, a lot of my referral was bifurcations. I know it sounds silly now, but for a very long time. And my patients would be sitting in my office and saying, well, what about that branch that'll go down and I'll have a heart attack? I said, well, first of all, why do you know about that branch? <laughs> why, right. why are they discussing it? Because the operators would sort of be talking the patients out of the procedure. And I'd say, well, it's okay if, if we can, um, you know, we can manage it. If it closes down, we can open it up again. It's not that complicated. Um, so I think it's twofold. It's, you know, it's, it's an adverse outcome from the anatomic substrate or managing, you know, or managing the uh, comorbidities. And, you know, frequently there's an intersection, but I think you can segregate them out into two because those are two different uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. So the complexity could be the patient, the complexity could be the anatomic substrate. Mm -hmm. So that's where that comes from. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. And I think it'll continue to be something that we all discuss, hopefully in person again soon and, and, and continue to pontificate over. And but, uh, I love but I think that, but people, what I like about the CHIP acronym is that 
my statement is people come up to me and tell me they're chip operators and I'm saying, that's, right. well, that's great. I'm not, am I? I mean, how to, yeah, how that's to, right. Know that. That's right. That's right. No, I think that that's exactly right. Everybody's a chip operator in yeah. some aspect, but it, but as we continue to evolve that and continue to have educational efforts for it, hopefully, hopefully that'll be more and more true. Um, you know, what do you, so, so we've talked about what chip is and sort of how that came to be. What do you think that that's going to look like over the next five to 10 years? And what are some of the hurdles yeah. that this whole idea movement's going to have during that time? Yeah, well, I think, well, I think the dem, I mean, uh, to, to put it one way, the demographics are on our side. <laughs> you know, we have an age population, you have, uh, you know, you have all these patients who were doing a good job and keeping alive. I mean, when you talk about surgical turndowns, what about the post-ops? I mean, they are, you know, they're living 20, 30 years, which is wonderful, but, you know, that's a whole variety of new challenges that historically have never been anticipated because we haven't had people living this long. Um, but I think the real challenge um, is the evidence base. And that's why I think, uh, fortunately, there are some, you know, studies going on now. And uh, there are, you know, even some randomized studies in this space, which I think is wonderful. But I think ultimately, it's going to come down to the evidence base. Because, you know, there's always, you know, the pushback is perpetual. Um, and, you know, my attitude is, give the patient the benefit of the doubt. In other words, you know, everything isn't about a p-value of 0.05. You know, I like the Bayesian attitudes better. Is it an 80% chance this will work? I like that sure. better. And, um, but you know, we're still going to have that. And even now, I mean, let's face it, in the wake of uh, ischemia, the sort of the, the mantra is, despite my interpretation of ischemia, which is actually pathophysiologically very illuminating, that we prevent MIs with stents. I mean, I think that's, you think about the pathophysiologic implications of that, that's a big deal. And, and mm -hmm. you know, in a quality of life like, but it's now the mantra is by a whole large part of the academic establishment is that, you know, angioplasty doesn't help. When you start with that foundation, um, that, that's, a big, that's a big mountain to climb to, to overcome that, especially with populations that we're dealing with who are hard to randomize. Mm -hmm. So I think evidence base uh, is, is, is critical. Yeah. Yeah, and I think I think we've really shifted, you know, over the past five years to say evidence, evidence, evidence. Now that we know what we can do, let's figure out who we should be doing it in. I think that that is going to be, I agree with you wholeheartedly, really critical to the success of figuring out how to best care for this patient group, particularly as you move forward with this aging population. And as you say, with all the comorbidities that continue to, to, to sort of mount, I think it's really interesting, this idea. And forgive me for the brief sidetrack, I, um, I came up to work with Dimitri a couple of years ago uh, for a few days and Ajay said, hey, you should go to this uh, St. Francis uh, physiology imaging course, you know, the course you guys have every year. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I'll go sit in the back and um, it was fantastic first. Second, we, you were talking about FFR, something you probably don't even think about. And you talked about this idea of, look, 0.08 is an inflection point, you know, with a certain, you know, receiving operator curve under it that we decided that was the inflection point, just like we decided that 0.05 was our statistical significance inflection point at some point. But patients still with an FFR of 0 0.81, 0 0.82, 0 0.83, if you look at the FAME trials, they, they still derive the benefit, some of those patients. And you, you, you sort of introduce this idea of it's about the patient on the table. If they're on multiple drugs and they're still having pain, they have an FFR of 0.82, that's still your patient and you know them, you probably yeah. still need to think about treating them. And that, if you think about that more broadly in this patient group, there is the hardcore medicine and then there's taking care, there's the hardcore data and then there's taking care of patients every single day. And there's this interplay that truly continues to be the art of medicine that you really still see in high risk PCI in chip cases that I, for better or for worse, feel that it's much more at play than necessarily some of my ro more routine stuff where it's like, Here's the data point, here's the stress test, here's what not. It's much more of an artistic expression of taking care of people and it's, it's not always clear cut. And I think uh, folks like you who sort of incorporate that into your mantra and you just sort of say it in these random comments that people like me, you know, sort of taken aback by like, oh my gosh, I think that just changed the way that I view how I take care of patients. I think that kind of thinking is critical. Well, I, I call, I did, you know, 
when FFR was emerging and the syntax score became, was, you know, the anatomic syntax score was sort of the arbiter of which way you went with PCI, I called it paint by numbers. And you, you can't do that. I mean, you know, you have to understand, and the key is, and this is why you have to know the evidence and the foundation of the evidence. It's not the, you know, the top line of the study. Right. It's how, what, 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 where did that number come from? What is the, uh, what's the reality of it? Whether it's, the, you know, syntax scores, risk scores, FFRs, IFRs, and understand what the limitations are. These are biologic systems. They are not binary. And, uh, and it's really important that if you understand the underpinnings, you can incorporate your judgment. It's not like, oh, I just do it my way. It's really based on the foundation that built that to that number. And it's very, you know, and if you know that, then you can actually use it to the patient's advantage and understand yeah. their limitations and their strengths. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, so now that we've sort of talked about CHIP, what it is, some of the underpinnings and all of these things, for people that want to continue to learn, continue to get better, this is all assuming post-pandemic, what do you think some of the best educational opportunities are for people out there, kind of starting from really high level and working down for those that may have really limited opportunities versus those who may have a little bit more broad-based opportunities? Yeah, well, I, look, my vision, and I think we're trying to refocus on this, and I know Sanjog, you know, we're working on, you know, you've been part of it too. We're trying to get this manuscript out. You can really sort of get a clarion call. But my, from the very beginning, I thought of it more as sort of a, a, a modular education. In other words, there are, there are certain skills and cognitive uh, uh, understanding that you have to have about a whole variety of issues, whether it's technical aspects of access or how arthrectomy looks, works and the like, and also just how to, you know, just how to uh, collaborate in a multidisciplinary disciplinary team to really optimize everything for these complex patients, whether it's EP or the valve or the, the, the renal service. And I think, you know, gain, really focusing down, in, I'm, I'm big in really deep dives, because even if you don't need all the information you have and can't even retain all of it, if you understand the methodology and the approach, that sticks with you. And then as, I mean, I'm a big believer, obviously, in keeping up with the literature, as difficult as that is sometimes. Yeah, but at least you can dive into these papers that may not even be your specific expertise, whether it's, you know, say, renal failure and AKI and, you know, all the nuances of it, but at least you can, you know, dive into that and keep up with where the field is moving because you understand the problems and the approach and the methodology. So I, I really, you know, that's why, you know, hemodynamic support is one thing. I mean, I thought that, you know, the hemodynamic support meetings, you should be able to come out there and sort of be able to fix the carburetor out of a meeting like that. You've got to have that, You've got to be that at home with it, or at least know that it can be fixed mm -hmm. and the like. And then I, that's why I like, you know, the CTO meetings, I think, you know, me, you know meetings that, uh, you know, focus on other complex anatomy or arthrectomy. I, I would, I think putting it together is very nice. I think over the years it became a little too generic and the meetings just sort of through slap there, shall talk about this and to talk about that. I think for, for those, you can't do a CHIP fellowship, which is in most of the world. Um, you really should be able to learn individual skills and stack it up and also understand what resources you need at your hospital and what your capabilities are for your hospital and put the teams together and do, deal with administration to actually focus uh, on the whole program. So it's, it's sort of the discrete elements and then the whole you know, big picture and how you put the team uh, together. I think that's the way uh, individuals should go. Yeah, that's fantastic, and I couldn't agree more. Okay, last question. So for our younger, sort of early to mid-career viewers who, who, who look at operators like you on the mountain and they think, okay, how can I sort of forge a path similar to this? How can I sort of work towards that ideal? What kind of advice would you give them for that? Well, I think there are several things, you know, obviously talking about building your skills, mm -hmm. but also, you know, know your limits, mm -hmm. you know, that doesn't mean stop there. When you're, mm -hmm. when you're at an area of discomfort, you know, work, have help, have mentorship, have a proctor, 
Um, I'm actually hoping, hoping that one of the good outcomes of this pandemic is remote proctoring. Mm -hmm. and our, I mean, that, you know, that is taking shape and there are tools that are, you know, that are being developed. So, and, you know, and, and also, you know, know when to stop. I mean, you know, I mean, there's, I mean, I'll say this in the CTO space and I think actually, I'm not, I'm not saying this in a bad way, I'm saying it in a good way. I think over the last couple of years, there's been a little bit of a pullback and, you know, in terms of saying, well, maybe we can stop here and not do that torturous epicardial that we might have done three or four years ago. And I think, you know, understanding that balance that you can always come back and fight another day and, you know, coming out with a, you know, a, you know, it may not be a big W, but maybe a little W and, you know, has set the stage for future success. I think that's key. You don't have to focus on how this is going to look at a conference. You got to think about the long term outcomes for the patient. That's right. I could not agree with that more. And as we continue to evolve and see the space change with the data coming out, new techniques, incorporating this idea, just like you said, how do we continue? Because these longer procedures, there's so many steps. It's always this risk benefit ratio that you continue to evaluate, not just you know in your pre-procedure clinic visit, but every step as you take the patient through that procedure, it's this continued back and forth of, okay, my next move is this, what is my risk benefit here to the patient overall and to this procedure? And I think the wisdom in that cannot be overstated and sort of, it takes a long time. As somebody who's still trying to learn that, it takes a long time to get that under your belt. So thanks, thanks for saying that. So Dr. Moses, thank you so much uh, for spending time with us today and enlightening us with your experience. On behalf of TCTMB Chip Newsletter, thank you all again for joining us and we look forward to bringing you new content again next month. Well, thanks for having me. It's great. You guys are doing a great job. Absolutely. Absolutely.